Welcome back to Unsolicited Advice, brought to you by Toxic Bubblegum. I'm Bubblegum. I'm Toxic. And today we're talking about Valor. Like Team Valor. I like the Pokemon thing. Uh, the only like team that. that we do not have represented here. Yeah, we, uh, hmm, fuck. But it's fine. It's totally fine. It's totally fine. I didn't skip over the description for Team Valor at all when I was reading nice. the Pokemon. I didn't <laughs> skip over almost all the things just because I thought I could read them again. Uh, so I've got a uh. quote for us. Um. Um, in a false quarrel, there is no true valor. And that is William Shakespeare. Is that from a play or is that just Shakespeare? Yep. Mm -hmm. It is uh, attributed to William Shakespeare. All right, cool. Well, that's all you need to know. Hashtag quarrel. So <laughs> <laughs> Hashtag quarrel. Hashtag team mystic. It's all good. Hashtag Gryffindor forever. Hashtag team mystic. <laughs> Hashtag, we know Valor. <laughs> this is off to a great start. We're totally on topic for the podcast. Uh, so when we were talking about Valor in the car, uh, <laughs> we were talking about the Pokemon Go teams. And uh, how we weren't a part of it. And we probably should have had a yeah. Valor person here. Uh, but we only uh, know one person on Team Valor. and He's in class. And also we're mad at him. <laughs> A little bit. <laughs> <laughs> no. No. Uh, we did have a fun uh, conversation. We had a lot of fun conversations because we were also talking about Hogwarts houses. Right. Because uh, I was I was not super into Pokemon <laughs> as a child. Um, and when the Pokemon Go thing started, I was trying to figure out what team I needed to be on. And I was trying to like, because a lot of people were trying to explain them to me in like the terms of the Hogwarts houses. So I was like, uh, I was almost on Team Valor for that reason, because uh, people were like, it's like Gryffindor, and I'm like, Gryffindor forever, and then I chose a different thing anyway. It was like, mm -hmm. so we were talking about, um, my new tramp stamp idea <laughs> is, uh, Gryffindor forever, <laughs> hashtag, hashtag Team Mystic. I am not responsible, also, is oh, on yeah, there, because you can't be responsible. Um... Add that to the list of tramp stamp ideas. It's very long. It's getting and annoying. very ridiculous. And I don't think you would actually get any of them as a ha uh, tramp stamp, as it turns out. I I would get the Deathly Hallows tramp stamp. That's true. That's fair. <laughs> or the Quake. I'd get a Quake tramp stamp. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Whoops. So anyway, hashtag Team Mystic. Hashtag um, Team Mystic. Yeah, so today we're talking about Valor uh, because it is the theme for this week, this month's zine. Yes. I don't know why I always try to say this week's. This week's zine? We have a zine this week? <laughs> Fuck. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's, so that should be coming out next week. Should be next week. Yes. Uh, we're doing good. We're, we're making good. progress on we're it. We're getting there. It'll be done. It'll work. It always does. But yeah, so we figured we'd just talk about the theme a little bit and, mm -hmm. you know, stuff related to it, because that's what we do. Uh, why am I talking? I shouldn't be talking. Uh, instead of talking, do you want to read our uh, definition of valor? Yes. So, um, valor is defined as great courage in the face of danger, especially in battle. Um, and then do you also want to read courage? And then courage is defined as the ability to do something that frightens one. So the two are sort of interlocking concepts. Uh, there is a little bit, um, like, there are different connotations uh, to valor. And what I found, because um, from a more historical standpoint, valor uh, does apply mostly to actions in battle. Right, like you um, get medals of valor and stuff like that yeah. for... So it's like, and even, yeah, because like when you look at the military, uh, that even kind of carries over. We have mm -hmm. um, awards for valor, but in a more uh, universal contemporary context, uh, when people say valor, what I've noticed is that they're usually applying it to physical actions. Right. Where, because uh, courage, um, because it is based off of your ability to handle fear, um, it is very subjective. So mm -hmm. it's like you could say 
there are like a lot of things that you could do mentally that might be the braver or a harder choice, whereas Valor is more of a physical confrontation. Right, it's typically. like the difference between like make like making the choice to do something in your mind versus walking up and doing it. Yeah. So it's like and that's not like a concrete thing, that's just a general connotation for yeah. how the words are used today. Right, that's just sort of uh, the, like, when you would use valor versus using courage. Yeah. Because valor sounds, it, it sounds more action-y, as it turns out. It's like. It does. It's good. Hashtag Team Mystic. Hashtag Team Mystic. Um, <laughs> I'm not even on Team Mystic. Um, that's you. You're that one. I am that one. Uh, but yeah, so, yes, you have a book. Here. I do have a book. Um, I, um, one of the things that I wanted to talk about is, well, because we always talk about our, we usually start by talking about how our theme for the podcast relates to media, mm -hmm. so I thought we could talk about, like, uh, some brave mm -hmm. characters. Mm -hmm. I'm going to branch out Valor to bravery, because mm -hmm. it's, like, a more wide concept, although if you have examples of Valor specifically, that's right. also a good, but if we had done just Valor, I would just be talking about Game of Thrones again for right. an hour. Oh no! <laughs> we're, yeah, no! We're branching it out. Ooh. It. We're going to talk about your favorite book for once. We are. Uh, we're talking Your actual my favorite actual book. actual legitimate favorite book is uh, To Kill a Mockingbird, and uh, it's because one of the characters, uh, I would argue... Maybe that Atticus Finch is like one of the bravest characters, but he's not who we're talking about today. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to talk about Mrs. Dubose. Nice. Um, and for those of you who have not read uh, To Kill a Mockingbird, uh, Mrs. Dubose is this really crabby, old, terrible <laughs> woman uh, who lives <laughs> down the street from the Finches. And she is always calling out like these mean things at the children. And um, Atticus is always really nice to her. No one understands because she says the worst things about him. And then he gets put on this trial. Uh, everyone is accusing him of not being a racist. Mm. And he, oh, uh, no! Is, not being a racist! Yeah, because he's uh, defending a black man in Alabama, <laughs> which is still not acceptable today in yeah, Alabama. Uh, anyway. Anyway, let's not get too into that. Yeah. Uh, so, she's, um, so she's always just, she's this really terrible person, and, um, Jem snaps at her one day, he destroys a bunch of her flowers, and as a punishment, um, Atticus sends her, sends, um, Jem to read to her every day. Mm -hmm. And, um, it isn't until after she's died that, uh, and he's supposed to, he has to go for, like, a week, but Atticus asks him to stay and read to her every week, every day after that, mm -hmm. anyway. Um, and you don't find out until after she's gone that she was dying. Mm -hmm. And she had a morphine addiction that she was trying to break before she died. Mm -hmm. Because she wanted to, even though she was in a tremendous amount of pain and, it, uh, like, her disease was terminal, she wanted to leave the world not beholden to anything or anyone. Mm -hmm. So that was, like, uh, so as he was reading to her, she was focusing on his words to try and push back the day that she took, the time that she took her morphine every day until she didn't need it anymore. Mm -hmm. So, um, so there's just, like, a little excerpt that I wanted to read, um, about Courage. Mm -hmm. that ties into that. Um, I think that was her way of telling you everything's all right now, Jem. Everything's all right. You know she was a great lady. A lady? Jem raised his head. His face was scarlet. After all those things she said about you, a lady? She was. She had her own views about things, a lot different from mine, maybe, son. I told you that if you hadn't lost your head, I'd have made you go read to her. I wanted you to see something about her. I wanted you to see what real courage is, instead of getting the idea that courage is a man with a gun in his hand. It's when you know you're licked before you begin, but you begin anyway, and you see it through no matter what. You rarely win, but sometimes you do. Mrs. DuBose won, all 98 pounds of her. According to her views, she died beholden to nothing and nobody. She was the bravest person I ever knew. That was a good one. It's, yeah. Uh, to Kill Mockingbird was one of those, uh, required readings that we had to do in school that was actually good. Yeah. Like, it's one of those th books that we should, like, still continue to read. Yeah. It is banned in places <laughs> like Alabama, probably. 
They do mm-hmm. not like To Kill a Mockingbird in Alabama. It's really weird. Uh, <laughs> I can't imagine. Uh, you go to Monroeville, and it's like To Kill a Mockingbird Central, because it was Harper Lee's hometown, and they right. have like all the commemorative stuff for her. Mm-hmm. Um, and you go further south, and everyone just hates this book so much. Uh, oh. I had more than one person tell me I should not be reading that. <laughs> in the time <laughs> that I lived down there. Uh, yes. If you read books, then you start thinking. Yeah, you start. That's dangerous. I had a lot of people recommend romance novels to me while I was down there. I was like, uh. uh. And of course, the Bible. <laughs> You've already read the Bible. I have read the Bible. I think probably more comprehensively than some of the people who have recommended it to me. <laughs> probably. <laughs> uh. But that's not why we're here. Jesus. Had a lot of valor. Yes. That's like an actual thing. That, yeah. Uh, um, but uh, let's not talk about the Bible. Okay. Uh, probably not. <laughs> that doesn't seem correct that doesn't to seem do correct. on our media podcast. Uh, <laughs> I think Although. we might offend some people, <laughs> probably. Also, I haven't read the Bible, so I don't. That's fair. Have you watched the miniseries? <laughs> oh, No. <laughs> no. <laughs> No, I don't think I will. What was, it, was it Netflix? Did the probably TV series? What was what, the Bible? Oh, uh, do you have some valor you want to talk about? Do you have some bravery? Some bravery in media. Thanks. Uh, I'm gonna talk about One Piece for a second. Oh, nice. Um, so uh, I started One Piece, uh, which is a long rabbit hole to go down. Uh, but I'm playing Treasure Cruise right now, and it, like, it gives, like, an abridged version of the story, uh, and it's, like, one of the, um, one of the scenes that I think had, like, a lot of bravery in it was, um, spoilers for One Piece, um, I guess, (laughs) I know, also spoilers for To Kill a Mockingbird that we already gave. Yeah, spoilers. Uh, as always on this podcast. Uh, anyway, so there's a scene. I forget not everyone has read to kill Mockingbird. <laughs> uh, we even have listeners in Alabama who are going to dislike this video now. <laughs> uh, oh no. Um, so there's the scene uh, where one of their crew members uh, has like made a deal uh, with the government. Uh, so like. She had to leave their crew, and she's, like, going to be locked up and executed. Uh, And she made this deal so that the rest of them would be able to sail away safely. Like, they wouldn't get uh, captured by the government, and, like, they wouldn't be killed, and stuff like that. Um, But so, in One Piece fashion, they're like, Luffy's like, no... No, I'm coming to rescue you, and you're gonna join my crew because I'm not letting you leave. Uh, and so there's the scene where they're like going to get her, and like they're in front, they're in front of like the military building, and the leader of the unit is like he like points up at the like um, the world government flag and is like, "That's the power of the whole world. There's no way you can." Um, don't you understand the power of what you're up against here? There's no way you can win. And Luffy's like... And he's like, you have to surrender. And Luffy's like... No, I know what I have to do. Hey, can you burn that flag? Can you just, like, shoot down that flag? And they do. And they basically declare war on the entire government just to save their friend. And I was like, that's a real good scene. I think that's a, like a real, like, pinnacle moment, Mm -hmm. because it's, like, really showing that, like, if you're that dedicated to something, like, there's no length you won't go to to see it achieved, Uh, no matter who's standing in your way, like, even if it's one person or the entire government, which has never gone wrong in the past, Um, but yeah, that's... That's what I've been thinking about in relation to Valor. I thought it was just like a real good, it's a real good scene, as it turns out. I like it. Anime is real good for Valor, I feel like, because it's very dramatic all the time. Yeah. Um, this is not the next one I was going to talk about. Um, 
remind me again. You're in charge of reminding me because I do have a uh, timely, like an actual timely, a timely thing. thing? thing oh, to that's talk right. About. Um, but another thing, I think fantasy is really good for Valor mm -hmm. uh, because it does get that more historical, that battle setting. Right, because so, there's literally usually giant wars happening. Yeah, and I am going to talk about Game of Thrones a little bit. Oh no, because uh, I, I want to <laughs> talk about. Um, I want to talk about Daenerys mm -hmm. again. I I kind of want to talk about Mance Raider, but I'm not going to because mm. no one knows who that is. <laughs> uh, I'm going to talk about Daenerys. Uh, Game of Thrones spoilers season three. Surprising uh, or Storm of Sword, A Song of Ice and Fire spoilers. I guess say the thing, cat. Okay, uh, <laughs> so uh, it gets uh, Daenerys is trying to get an army. Right. And uh, they recommended that she goes to get the Unsullied, which is an army of slave soldiers that they breed in Astapor. Mm -hmm. um, and they've been trained from a very from the time that they're boys. They're uh, mutilated and trained to become, like, the world's best soldiers. They're the most obedient. They're, like, great fighters. They're essentially killing machines. Yeah. And it's very expensive. And so they're, like, so she gets... Uh, this choice, right? Where she's like, the only way that she can pay for this army is with a dragon. Because that's the only thing she has of value when she walks into Astapor. Right. So it's like, I can uh, trade one of my children, essentially, uh, for this army of slave soldiers, mm -hmm. or I can um, go and make alliances and see who... Because um, she actually has an offer of support from, mm -hmm. like, one of the kings of this other city, but uh, he's kind of shady. Like, he sold her <laughs> into marriage. Yeah, that uh, would... Was how she met him. That would be so pretty bad. bad. So she's like... Uh, and then she'd have to leave Astapor, and she wouldn't be able... She wouldn't have her army. She couldn't conquer anything. She would just have to do whatever this guy says, because he rescued her right. from a town that wanted to kill her. So uh, she's given, like, this really terrible choice where there are, like, these two options, and her counselors are, like... Half of them are, like, you need to buy this army, and half of them are, like, it's better just to walk away from this if you have slave soldiers, no one's gonna want you in Westeros because they don't believe in slavery, you know? Right. Um, As most... Same people do. <laughs> right. So she's given this really terrible choice. And instead of choosing either of those things, uh, she thinks about her brother Rhaegar Targaryen, the last dragon. And um, his he had, like, this amazing... The odds were stacked against him, and he fought this really fantastic battle. Um, the Battle of the Trident. And she thinks about him and, like, all of the courage that it must have taken him to... Uh, cross the river and go into that battle knowing he was probably going to lose mm -hmm. and she thinks about that and then she takes her dragon in uh, to be traded and as soon as the ownership of the unsullied army is transferred over to her she turns on the masters and she mm -hmm. has her dragon burn them all and she takes her new unsullied army she's like kill every person uh, kill every man or woman who holds a whip like, we're ending this right now. And she conquers all of Astapor. Because mm -hmm. she was able to buy every single Unsullied soldier that was there. And have them all turn against as a unit. And as soon as it's done, uh, she throws, like, the whip aside. And she's like, you're free. And she lets everyone go. And mm -hmm. they choose to follow her into battle. And it's like, it was one of my favorite moments on the show. Mm -hmm. And in the book. It's really good. I a lot of the stuff with Daenerys is a lot of valor, as yeah. it turns out, because she's constantly, she's constantly facing odds that are against her, uh, and it's like especially over in that area, yeah. Because like everyone's like, she's a foreigner, she's got dragons, she's also a she, yeah, and that was like. Uh, that, I think, was the moment because, like, she's always had really tough odds. And it's like, we can always see her doing brave things. Like, even when she marries Khal Drogo, it's mm -hmm. one of those things where it's like, she's sold to him, but then she consciously makes the effort mm -hmm. to, like, do something with the power that she has being married to him. Right. Like, um, and she takes a lot of the initiative there. But uh, when she conquers Astapor, it's where... Um, she's not using anyone else's power, she's using all of her own resources and turning mm -hmm. it into a physical source of action, which is why I thought it would be good for Valor specifically. 
Yeah, that makes sense. Because it's just like generally Daenerys is one of the bravest. Right, just sort of consistently always doing probably the least recommended option, <laughs> but what she believes is the most correct option. Yeah. Uh, which I think is very, that's very Valor, uh, as it turns out. Um, hmm. What are other, I'm trying not to just talk about more anime. <laughs> Oh no. Oh no. Uh, do you have any game choices? Let me. Oh no. I feel like. I should. Um, I'm gonna make an argument for Doom here. Nice. Uh, like, I'm gonna it's say. Not an argument. I'm not gonna fight you on this. <laughs> but... We're fighting. Oh. I'm gonna make you fight me. No, um, <laughs> I'm gonna argue that uh, Doom Guy shows a lot of courage slash valor. Oh, yeah. Uh, because, first of all, uh, he makes the conscious decision, uh, to go, like, he's, like, like, when he wakes up, he's, like, stuck, and, like, he's, like, chained down to the table, and he wakes up, and, like, something's coming to kill him, and he kills it, obviously, because he's Doom Guy. Um. Of course. But, like, then he goes, and he, like, picks up his suit, uh, and he sees everything, like, he gets... Like, all the flashbacks of hell and everything, and he knows just how bad the situation is, and it's, like, going back to, like, spite, I, f I feel like he does, he's Valor, uh, but he doesn't, he doesn't do it out of knowing what's right, he's, he does it out of, he's fucking pissed, uh, that everyone was stupid enough to let this happen, uh, cause it's, like, he- gets the suit, and he gets all the memories, and he knows just how bad the fucking situation is. Mm. He's like, yeah, this is fucking, the, it's legitimately been overrun by demons. Everything's bad. And then, like, he gets in the elevator, and Hayden, like, gives him the choices. Like, you can work with me, and we can work, that we can make this work. It's, these sacrifices uh, were what we had to do, and then he just, like, fucking punches the communicator. And it's like, he's like, no... I'm gonna kill all these demons because it's what we have to do, and you didn't have the courage to do it, so I'm gonna do it. Uh, so I'd say, I'd say that's like it's like a different, yeah, it's sort of valor because it's not based on like I know what's right. It's I'm gonna do what no one else would or could. Yeah, because I'm the only one that can do it. Also, you're fucking dumb, <laughs> Samuel Hayden. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Nice. So that's. I think that's a... Yeah, that's a good one. I think it's an interesting one, because, like, I feel like a lot of valor and courage... Because it's like, like we said with the courage definition, it's like to do what scares you. Mm -hmm. And usually that's like making conscious decision to be like, I'm going to do this thing because I know it's the right thing, so even though I'm scared of it, I'm going to do it. Um, it's usually like, I'm doing this for the betterment of everybody versus this, which is... I'm mad, and you guys are idiots, so I guess I'll do it. <laughs> uh, it's, it feels more like an anti-hero sort of yeah. motivation. There's also... <laughs> I'm never going to make it to my uh, timely pop culture. You're never going to. There, there's also... I'm going to talk about it real fast, and I'm going to be done. But mm -hmm. in the first chapter of Game of Thrones... <laughs> There's You're uh, killing me! Ned <laughs> Stark has to behead a deserter from the Night's Watch. Mm -hmm. And uh Bran's watching, uh it's the first beheading that he goes to, and he's watching his siblings uh and how they react to seeing this man get decapitated. Mm -hmm. And uh Rob says that the man dies bravely because he goes to his death, he doesn't fight, he gives his last words and he like says his piece and lets them take his head. Um, and John is, like, looking at the man's eyes when he dies, and he's, like, he was terrified. Mm -hmm. Like, he didn't die bravely. Uh, and so Bran goes up to his father, Neddard, uh, Neddard? Neddard. Neddard. Or Ned, but not Neddard. <laughs> That's not a thing. <laughs> he goes up to his uh, father, Ned Stark, and he's, like, um, he's talking about the beheading and... Um, Ned asks him what he thought about it, and Bran explains the situation uh, between Rob and John, and Ned's like, and what do you think? And Bran thinks about it, and he's like, can a man be brave if he's afraid? And Ned's like, that's the only time a man can be brave. It's like, 
It's just good. It was good. That's a good quote. It was a really good quote. Was that the quote you were thinking about? I using? really wanted to use it again. Uh, did you want to talk about your good. timely pop I culture reference? Do you now? want to talk about my for timely? real? For real? For real? We're getting there. I guess. <laughs> um, even though it's not Game of Thrones, it's not Game of Thrones. You watch other things. <laughs> uh, speaking there of were... other things, I watch um, and things. This is so timely because uh, we just got uh, season two of A Handmaid's Tale launched yesterday. Mm-hmm. Uh, Handmaid's Tale is a really good. Uh, Offred generally is a really good example of bravery mm-hmm. and valor because uh, it's one of those things where it's like um, they live in this. Uh, Gilead is America in the future. Mm. It's one of those uh, post-apocalyptic stories where there's right. a nuclear war. Um, everyone handles it badly, but America goes like above and beyond, and we handle it bad. Well, uh, that's because that's <laughs> what we do here so, in America. Uh, we turn into Gilead, which is a uh, religious-based society where women are considered to be second-class citizens. I'm waiting. I'm waiting for the difference. It's there is what it is now. It's called Gilead. Okay, <laughs> we got there. Uh-huh. So, <laughs> the only difference. Fuck. Uh, uh, but fertility has been dropping in, mm-hmm. in the society because of all of the chemical warfare that's been happening. Right. Uh, so women uh, can't have, most women can't have children. There's, like, a very high uh, infant death rate. Um, and when all of the women are, like, rounded up uh, in the creation of Gilead, they're broken down. Any fertile women become handmaids, mm-hmm. uh, which is essentially... Li- the. They have to give birth to other people's children, right? Um, and it's it's a very disturbing show. Honestly, it's like it's very dark, but it in such an oppressive society, it's one of those things where like even the little acts of defiance come across as so incredibly brave. Mm-hmm. And uh, where I think Offred would be a really good example of valor is that uh, she sees she takes these like little symbols that everyone has left, like, these small acts of defiance, and she turns it into a physical act of defiance. Um, Mm -hmm. There's a point in season... Oh, and Handmaid's Tale spoilers. That's all exposition. Right. But uh, we are getting into some spoilers for season one. Um, And the book, that's also... (laughs) Right, the entire book. The entire book. Um, But it's one of those things where it's like, uh, they're asked to... The handmaids get to execute people. Mm -hmm. Um, Like... Uh, rape is a punishable offense, like, but you get stoned to death. Mm-hmm. Uh, they do go back to very archaic forms of punishment, right? Is like one of the big things because their whole religious system is based off of the Bible, right? So, um, they're asked to stone the uh, guy to death, and we get to see that, and then later they're asked to stone one of the handmaids to death mm-hmm. because she had endangered a child, which is like the one thing you absolutely cannot do no matter who you are. Mm-hmm. So they are asked to like stone one of their own to death. And you can see there's like so much hesitance in everyone's face, but Offred is the first one. She holds the stone out and drops it. Mm-hmm. And you can see like everyone after that follow her suit. But mm-hmm. it's like she's the one who initiates a lot of those physical things. Oh uh, but one of the first uh this was the other one I had thought about using for the beginning quote. Uh-huh. Uh because one of the first Things of defiance that we see her do, um, or that we see that she stumbles across. Uh, she finds graffiti written. Uh, women are not allowed to read in Gilead. Mm-hmm. That's uh, if they catch you reading, they take a finger, and if they catch you reading a second time, they take the whole hand. Because mm-hmm. um, you don't need hands to have kids. Ha! <laughs> <Huh. laughs> That's like a big uh, recurring theme. Is like you don't need that. <laughs> Just gotta have some kids. God. Uh, They're like, uh, there's a lot of eyes getting gouged out. Jesus. It's a a scary show. Um, But she's in her closet, and she finds that the handmaid before her, um, the offered that came before her, has carved into the bottom of the closet uh, the words... uh, Yeah, look it up. Yeah, I probably should, because it's in fake Latin. It's in false Latin. It's in, uh, it's n- Notori Bastardus uh, de Carborandarum, mm-hmm. which doesn't translate specifically, but it, the thing is, it's, it's like kind of a joke uh, because it doesn't translate correctly, uh, which is how you find, because the man who had made the joke um, was the one who caused the offered 
before the offer that we know uh, to kill herself. Right. So it was like, it was a clue going on to that, but what the phrase actually would translate to is don't let the bastards grind you down, Mm -hmm. which uh, she takes as kind of a personal motto as she's doing all of these acts of defiance throughout the show. And in that episode, we also get to see um, her friend, uh, while they were being trained to be handmaids, her friend at the Red Center had also taken, like, a huge personal risk to carve, like, vulgar messages about Mm -hmm. the people who had taken them. And they go through, like, what the punishment is for writing in there. And it's, like, it's bad. And she's, like, Offred's trying to explain. She's, like, it's not worth it. Don't risk getting caught just to, like, be angry about this. And uh, her friend Moira looks at her and she's, like... Um, if someone else sees that there's defiance, they'll have, they'll be able to stand up Mm -hmm. when we can't. And it's like, it was just, it was such a powerful moment because it's like, as we're starting to see, Offred is the one who's like taking the initiative to stand up to everyone in the Mm -hmm. society because, and like what snaps her back into, I have to defend myself, I have to get out of this situation, is that she has seen someone else carve these words. Right. Into the closet. So it was just, it was, it was well done. It was like a good transition of, like, inner strength turning into actual... Outer strength. Outer strength. And it's a good show. If you can handle being really depressed for an hour at a time, I highly recommend Handmaid's Tale. I'm depressed all the time, baby! (laughs) Watch Handmaid's Tale! Woo! It's all good! (laughs) Don't watch Handmaid's Tale. It'd be very triggering for you. Oh, no. It's like an incredibly... I would recommend the book, because mm-hmm. they, like, uh, skim past a lot of the actual physical stuff that happens. Right. Whereas the show does not. Whereas there is, like, a lot of... There's a lot of uh, upsetting things, as I understand. Yeah, uh, impregnating the handmaids mm-hmm. is something that we get to see way too much of. Wow! Uh, Hate that. Yeah, it's... Um, so weird. Because uh, they also have the wives there. Of course. So it's like a three-person uncomfortable situation happening. The one person's not even involved in. <laughs> yeah. It's like, this is weird. But it comes with a lot of Bible quotes. Oh, good. We get to see the biblical uh, protocol for this. We're back on the Bible yeah. thing. It's time to talk about the Bible, guys. So there's this <laughs> mini-series on that. <laughs> oh, no! <laughs> Probably on Netflix. <laughs> I think it is on Netflix. Because I think it was before I got Hulu that I saw it. Mm-hmm. Maybe it's it is on Hulu. I'm going to be embarrassed. No one cares. I don't think, <laughs> I don't anyone, think anyone it. <laughs> yeah, I don't think anyone except people that already care are going to watch. They're probably not. They probably stopped listening to our podcast the first time we talked about Handmaid's Tale. <laughs> right now. <laughs> I brought it up other times. I'm sorry, I couldn't One other hear. time. I couldn't hear through all the Game of Thrones. <laughs> <laughs> that's fair. That's fair. Um, but that's something, and it's something that we kind of said when we, I was talking about Handmaid's Tale before in world building, um, mm-hmm. but it's one of those things where it's like, in contextually, a little bit will go a long way. Mm-hmm. Oh, and we also talked about it like for humor and horror. Oh, but yeah. It's like, it only, um, if you have, if you're, Working in an oppressive society, especially one that has been blown to the proportions that Handmaid's Tale is, Uh, if you're in a setting like Gilead, it only takes a small act of defiance to come across as, like, the biggest thing ever. It's, uh, because it's like, uh, because it's like a machine, basically. Uh, no matter how small the hiccup in the machine is, you're very aware of it. Yeah. Because suddenly it's not working as you expected it to. And, like, one small thing leads to another. Yeah. And soon the machine is broken. Hopefully. We hope. We hope. (laughs) We won't find out for a while, because it's a weekly release. Yeah. Yeah. Never gonna know what happens. You're gonna want to find out at the end of this. You're still watching it. You're so sad. I'm sorry. I forget. Um, 
I forgot that Handmaid's Tale was not all uploaded at once, and I went to marathon it yesterday, and I got two episodes, and was like, where's the rest of my series? Where's the rest of it? Why is it not here with me right now? I need to know what happens. (laughs) But you will. I will eventually. You just have to wait. This has been a bad time. Hulu still doesn't have season three of Rick and Morty, and I'm not getting new Game of Thrones until 2019. You're also not getting new Rick and Morty until 2019. It doesn't matter. I'm two seasons behind. <laughs> where the hell? Like, where the hell? But they, they put Kitchen... It's fine. They put Kitchen Nightmares back on. Just they, watch Kitchen they Nightmares. They put Kitchen Nightmares back on. And Hell's Kitchen. See, that's all you need. I've got lots of Gordon Ramsay things to watch. Speaking of... Yeah. Valor. Yeah. Gordon Ramsay's here. Oh my god, yes. <laughs> <laughs> This is a Gordon Ramsay podcast, though we can't just talk it about it. It should be a Gordon Ramsay podcast. <laughs> Unsolicited what? advice, watch Gordon Ramsay. <laughs> this is the subtitle of the podcast now. <laughs> oh. No, that man, um, no, uh, real life Valor, I think, is shooting six seasons of Kitchen Nightmares and then still showing up for the seventh season and eating that food before he investigates the kitchen. Yeah, that's true! <laughs> After six seasons. Still doing I would it. not have done that. I would have, like, I would have shown up, I would have eaten, I would have seen the kitchen in that first episode and I would have been like, I'm doing kitchen inspections before I ever eat food anywhere ever again. <laughs> Literally, even when I'm not on the show? <laughs> Goddamn. I might have stopped eating out. Like, That's fair. Oh. It's bad. It's a lot really bad. Oh. Oh. God. Um, an example of contemporary valor, though, um, mm-hmm. in all seriousness, I was talking about Gordon Ramsay, but I am going to talk about one of my other favorite uh, celebrities, John mm-hmm. Oliver, Ooh, saving John the Oliver. world. He is John. He's, he's good. So he's a good man. What are we talking about, John Oliver, this time? Um, just because he's, like, uh, every week, last week tonight, he does a show uh, where he talks, he takes an issue that he feels is not getting enough press attention, Mm -hmm. or that people are not, they don't have, like, a comprehensive understanding of, and he explains it, um, so that it's just all out there. And he does a different one of these every week, but he goes above and beyond. And I know it's just because he has, like, a ridiculous budget. Right. Because he works for HBO. Of course. Uh, he can do whatever he wants. <laughs> but he uses that power to, like, take on people I would be pretty scared to take on. <laughs> yeah! <laughs> if I were a talk show. <laughs> if I were, like, a comedian. Right. I'd be like, maybe I don't have the power to take on all of these, uh political figures, but he, like, does not back down from anything, and he's constantly picking fights with people. It's good. It's, Somebody uh, needs to. Someone has to, and John Oliver is doing it. Uh, we already, we talked about the, um, Marlon Bundo book. God, I love Marlon Bundo. But that was, like, that was a bold move, because he, like, very specifically targeted Mike Pence, <laughs> and was like, I'm going to ruin your book, because I like your rabbit, and it absolutely destroyed him. Like, ugh. Which is good. Needs it. And it's like, uh, and his show has a long history of doing that. Uh, like, he found out that uh, he took on all evangelists uh, by starting a church. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, where he basically made fun of them, and he spe- he, like, he because it was he found out like how easy it was to open up a church and get tax exemption mm-hmm. and to lie pe- lie to people into uh sending money. So he did that and then donated all of the money and he was like and he was really open about the church was called Our Lady of Perpetual Exemption. So it's like he wasn't trying to honestly con people. Um uh, just recently uh, cuz they were talking what are the, I should know this cuz I just what? watched the John Oliver about it. Um there are those I can't think of what they're called. What? The, Describe them. They're the vans that you can get. They're they don't. They're not considered to be a um, medical thing, but you can. They park outside of abortion clinics to offer free ultrasounds to pregnant women, and then trick them into keeping the baby. Oh my god! Uh, because they're not technically licensed as a medical facility, right? So they can get away with lying to people, of course, with an ultrasound machine. <laughs> but it's like uh, he recently bought a van. It's called Vanned Parenthood. Oh my god. So good. Uh, he got Rachel Dratch to just come make up ridiculous things. <laughs> but she gave that. him an ultrasound on the show. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, 
But yeah, uh, that's like, he really is, I think, one of the bravest people that we, because, and he's going about it in like a goofy, silly way, because he is, in fact, a, a comedian, comedian, but he is challenging things that he thinks are wrong. Right. I think it's been a long history of, I know, I'm not, I mean, obviously, I don't know every instance, but I mean, my first exposure to like comedians, like, actively challenging political figures and, like, making an active difference, I mean, started with Jon Stewart, because uh, yeah. that's where Colbert and John Oliver both got their starts, uh, was on his show, and he was always fucking putting out all the absolute bullshit going on, and, like, was there was one time, oh, I'm trying to remember the gift set I saw of it, it was, like, the, uh, like, talking about, like, how people, like, in, like, how Jews in Germany were rounded up with guns, like, with civilian-bought guns, and, like, then it's, like, some other, like, he had, like, a uh, guy arguing, like, for, like, uh, protection of gun rights, and it's, like, if the Jews in Germany had had guns, then they wouldn't have gotten rounded up, and he was, like, how did this all start again? <laughs> it's, like, you gotta know. But it's, like, so, but, yeah, it's, like, I feel like he really started, like, springboarding a lot of the challenging authority through comedy yeah. and like using that comedy to really show people how bad things are because it's it's so ridiculous as it should be a bit yeah but it's real uh and i think so i think all those like john stewart and colbert and john oliver and samantha b and like everyone that was in Noah. yeah like everyone in association with that show is just like they had a lot of guts they yeah. have a lot of guts. And that's something, uh, comedy uh, is something that has always kind of, like, historically has always been used to illustrate flaws in mm -hmm. um, government and oppressors, but it's one of those, um, it's one of those things, and the reason why, because I, I love all those shows. Right. I love all of the shows that have spawned from that, uh, but the reason why I do always talk about John Oliver as much as I do is because it's, he's not just pointing stuff out, he is taking action. And a lot of the time it's silly comedic action, but it is like that one step further that I do appreciate. Right, it's uh, the taking the words and turning them into something physical. Yeah, which is just like what we're talking about today. It's good. I like John Oliver a lot. John Oliver. I have a lot of respect for the man. Uh, but in... It's also, it's one of those things where it's like, um, you know, he has the resources and to do that. Right. There is something to be said. There's like, it's very important even just to point things out. Right. That's also, uh, especially uh, in a contemporary setting, we don't always have the actual battle. <laughs> right, because <laughs> as it turns out, it's a lot... Uh, there's a lot of battles going on consistently, but I mean, like, they're not, unlike in media, they're not, like, poetic, they're not, yeah, and, uh, they're just really horrible, uh, so it's one of those things where it's like, uh, taking the setting into account, uh, sometimes just laying it all out for people is action enough itself. Right, like, exposing it. Yeah. And making people think about it, because that's... A lot of people don't. A lot of people are just content to just be like, that's how it is. That's how things are. And it's like, wait, do you know why it is, though? Because maybe you should know why it is. That's also, that's a thing. Um, Handmaid's Tale. Ah! <laughs> because they, when they all get taken to the Red Center uh, for their handmaid training, mm -hmm. uh, they tell all these women, they're like, this seems weird, this seems strange to you now, but anything becomes normal if you, like, are exposed to it enough, eventually this is going to be normal. And then they tie it back around. Because um, one of the... They're cleaning off one of the walls of mm -hmm. all this blood because they had, like, a bunch of executions there. They have foreign dignitaries coming, so they're like, gotta clean the place up. So they have all the handmaids out, like, scrubbing blood off of this wall. Mm -hmm. And one of the handmaids kind of looks up and she's like, it's weird to see it 
without all the bodies. Mm -hmm. And everyone just gets kind of quiet, and she's like, you can get, you get used to seeing things in a certain way. And it's just like, a powerful moment. It's a mm -hmm. good show, you guys. It's good. But beware of those trigger warnings. Yes. Trigger warning for just about anything. <laughs> right, just, like, everything. As it turns out, just, just be aware of that going in. Yeah. Be very aware. And, or like, seriously, uh, if you want to read the book, it's, all the stuff is still there, it's still very disturbing, but it's not, it, like, graphic. Right. Like the show is. So. It's more of a thing. impression sort of thing. Yeah. Uh... But it is, like, uh, that's something that I do really like seeing in stories that take place in the future. Because mm -hmm. it's, like, it shows not just how we adjust to things as a society, but how people after us will also adjust to whatever the new normal is right. after that. Normal changes. Yeah. And it's, like... Ugh. There's a lot of... You get into a lot of messy social stuff with that uh, but it's like one of the things that always gets me is like fucking old conservative white people uh, being like having all these minorities uh, out in public and giving them the same rights as us white people uh, is bad and it's like no it's normal it's normal you're just being weird about it cause you can't adapt to change and that's, um, I eventually, maybe not, because I'm excited about it. Uh, <laughs> now that I'm on the, now that I finally made it to the topic. Uh, but that's also, because uh, when they're talking about, when they go back to show how Gilead spawned from America, mm -hmm. one of the things, because uh, they're talking about it, and, uh, like, all of the commanders are, like, we've made Gilead a better place, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's a bunch of rich white dudes. <laughs> this always this. is. Um, but when they get questioned about it, uh, the one uh, Commander Waterford kind of looks uh, away, and he's like, better never means better for everyone. <laughs> it always means worse for some people. And it's like... It's like, oh. Oh. <laughs> and the other thing that I... Uh, We'll say while we're on the because you brought up minorities. Mm -hmm. um, season two of Handmaid's Tale, uh, uh -huh. we get into like sexual identity mm -hmm. more, um, and it like we get back into one of the characters' histories and what she is taken for. She is a lesbian, mm -hmm. um, and they go through kind of like she's talking to her gay boss, and they're talking about like all the he wants to pull her off of like the team mm -hmm. and she's like really mad about it and he's like you know it's kind of for your safety these are the laws this is changing I don't want to put you in danger and it gets kind of quiet for a moment and he's like I thought my generation was the last generation that was going to have to deal with this kind of discrimination and it's like that's like oh man huh never <laughs> is though <laughs> and it, again Gilead you know it's like an extreme worst case scenario but it is like you always kind of think that you're making progress and that it's going to be better, better for the next generation, and then... All of a sudden, you realize rich white people screwed it up again! <laughs> but, like, in dealing with, like, minorities, it's just, it's crazy. Because that seems like such an obvious human rights... I don't understand how it's not obvious. <laughs> but apparently... I don't know... We need a rich white person on the show. <laughs> Do we? No. <laughs> okay. I might kill them on air. Oh, it would boy. be bad. Uh, highest rated episode. <laughs> God, I wish that were me. One uh, dislike from Alabama. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> oh, jeez. Uh, <laughs> it's fine. It's good. It's for, we need to eat the rich. That's just how life is. I don't know, Kat, you know it to be true. You know this. So, uh, righteous cannibalism, guys. What are your thoughts on righteous cannibalism? How comfortable are you with some righteous cannibalism? I'd say very comfortable. comfortable. Nice. 
<laughs> now I want to talk about Animal Rising, you guys. Wait, no. You stop that. <laughs> you stop that. That's, no. Was that's... it brave for Hannibal Lecter to eat the Nazis that fed him his sister? I don't know if brave is the right Leave word for that. Leave us your thoughts in the <laughs> comments below. <laughs> oh, no. I mean... <laughs> On that man, I mean, I think anything that kills Nazis is good. So, yeah. Fuck. Hannibal Lecter? <laughs> well, hold on. Our valor icon? <laughs> no? You stop that? Oh. oh, no. Oh, no. Um. Fuck. I don't know where to go from here. <laughs> So when you're writing, <laughs> for, I feel kill part some of me, Nazis. Part of me feels like we should just end the podcast there, but we didn't give any advice. We either. didn't give any advice. <laughs> but it would be so funny just to live to leave <laughs> on uh, Hannibal Lecter being our valor icon. I love that. Oh, I never know what I'm gonna say on this show. I don't know either. I never know. I just know he'll say something about Game of Thrones, and that's it. Oh. I just do. <laughs> <laughs> Fence? <laughs> Revenge cannibalism? Okay. Are they I got no That's no. enough of your cannibalism. You over there. <laughs> uh but when you are writing Valor, when you're writing uh any kind of courage, it is important to remember that it is subjective and right. that's something that uh you can really use to show like who your character is as a person. Right. It's like um, I think one of the essential things when you're writing a character who is, like, Valor is, like, one of their cornerstone things is first you have to, like, I think a really good way to do it is it sort of like uh, what you said with the Game of Thrones thing, uh, where it's, like, they're brave and terrified because that's the only way you can be brave. Yeah. I think a real good, like, if it's not, like, a main character who's learning to be courageous if it's like someone who's already courageous uh or valor valor whatever the um other thing is for that um valor tastic i like valor tastic i like that one <laughs> that's good i was just gonna keep throwing them at you my next one was valorious <laughs> valorious that's just your last name but weird nice um but so I think it's important, like, if it's a secondary character, like, you show them being brave and you show them being brave, but then at some point you have to show them being afraid. Yeah. Like, you have to either, like, in a flashback or, like, in a specific scenario that's really stressful, like, you have to show where that valor is coming from. And especially uh, when you are dealing with fantasy settings or any kind of battle setting where it's, like, a very literal kind of valor, uh, you have to take into account that what might appear as valor from an outside standpoint might not actually scare the person. Right. Because like, um, I don't, like, Jamie mm -hmm. uh, goes into battles all the time, and everyone thinks he's, like, the bravest person ever, uh, but it's because battle doesn't scare him. Right, it's so just it's another like, thing to do. Yeah, that's just what he likes doing, is just, like, going into battle. And we don't really see him scared for a long time. Right, because the thing is, battle doesn't scare him, but there are a lot of other things that do. Yeah. Uh, but they're all, like, really, like, emotional things. It's, like, one of the things you see a lot with, like, courage or valor, it's, like, like, there's a big fear of death, or, like, there's fear of getting hurt or anything like that. But it's, like, emotional courage is definitely also a thing because, like, emotions are scary. Yeah. I don't emotions like are, like, a lot scarier than... <laughs> but that's something, uh, when you are developing a character, it's important to know what scares them and why. So it's, like, um... And if you have someone, like, going into battle, it's, like, does the battle scare them? Is it the fear of death? Is it the pain that scares them? Or is it something more emotional? Is it what the battle represents? Is it the fear of losing? Is mm -hmm. it a lot of... Something that I found with uh, characters who traditionally display a lot of valor is that they're more afraid of not appearing courageous right. than they are of getting hurt. So it's, like, <laughs> they're kind of giving into their fears <laughs> by leading these attacks by, right like charging in by showing these displays it's actually just because not being seen that way is more 
terrifying to them. Right. Which doesn't make it wrong. It's not, like, the wrong option, necessarily. But it's, like... But it's like, different. Is again, not being courageous for the good of a bunch of people. It's more of a selfish thing. Yeah. Which sometimes that's the right motivation. That's not always... That's, being selfish is not inherently a bad motivation. Yeah. Uh... Like Doom God. Um, I think it's one of those things also where uh, if a character is going to do something courageous or valor-tastic or anything like that, uh, it has to be warranted. Like, it's one of those things where it's like when someone makes an act of defiance or like does something brave and you want it to be you want it to come across that way. Like, you want it to be like a, yeah, they're going for it. You want to make sure, first of all, that the character's liked uh, well enough That's fair. to have it be deserved. Um, and then, like, also it has to, the timing has to be right with it. Because it's like, it can't, it can't come out of nowhere. Like, it could appear to come out of nowhere, mm -hmm. but, like, there should be foreshadowing or there should be actual shadowing um <laughs> there should be it should be led up to you know um it's something that i really like it's uh one of my favorite aspects of the hunger games mm -hmm. um is because there is because katniss gets really mad at the capital like several right. points and then like right at the end uh the hunger games spoiler whoa spoiler, uh like right at the end when she takes those berries it's one of those things where it's like she just wants the capital to lose. Right. Like, and she knows that that's how it'll get done. Um, and they back down from it, but then, like, the next thing, it's, like, all trying to cover up what her motivation was in that, so that she can stay to fight another day. Right. And it's like... And it's, like, uh, pretending to be in love with PETA, uh, to cover herself, uh, from her act of defiance was a lot scarier to her. Right, because she wasn't. Then... <laughs> Almost eating poison. It's like fuck. Just it's, I should just be dead. Screw up. <laughs> like, but yeah, like it was like a fun uh, twist right. on character motivations. And they led up to it really well. I thought. Uh, I think I'm gonna. I've been staring at Madoka over there for like a while now. Nice. She's like hanging out over there, being cute. Uh, Madoka spoilers for anyone who hasn't. Suffered Madoka yet, <laughs> you poor things. Save yourselves. Um, don't watch Madoka. Watch Madoka. <laughs> oh no! Um, but so, I think the whole build up for uh, Madoka's sacrifice at the end of the show is really well done. Because she starts, she's a, she's a little bit of a crybaby. Yeah. As it turns out. Bit. When the show starts, she's a little bit of a baby. Um, and it's like, she does consistently display like bravery and stuff, um, like, trying to protect people, but, uh, the fact that she's willing to do this thing that erases her from everyone's memories in order to save everyone is, like, because you've really gotten that build-up of who she is and how much she cares about people, but you see that she's scared the whole time because it's a bad situation oh, yeah. that she's in. Everything's bad. Um, bad? Oh, God. Did this I make goes it? downhill so fast. <laughs> Did, uh, episode three, everything's terrible. Um, it's like it's such a swift drop, and then it just keeps spiraling. It just it's keeps just like spiraling. Oh, uh, it's one of those things <laughs> where uh, Madoka is such a tough show to talk about from a critical standpoint because by Western standards, it's like really good and like it's a lot of Western people consider it like a very feminist show, but then like in Japan, it's not. <laughs> Because the writer is a huge misogynist, and, yeah. like, it really enforces, like, a lot of negative stereotypes, so it's, like, really hard to talk about it from, like, a critical point of view, but I think that, like, that <laughs> sacrifice, like, I cried a lot. I'm a crybaby, as it turns out, um, but, like, her sacrifice was, like, a really big act of valor, because she saved the world yeah. with it, uh, and it's so sad. I was also going to talk about Homura, but <sighs> I can't, I can't, I can't do it! Oh no. I can't do it! Rebellion fucked it up so bad! That's, 
Yeah. <laughs> like, uh, if you do watch Madoka, don't stop <laughs> before Rebellion. Like, yeah, don't, don't watch, watch Rebellion. Rebellion. It literally ruins everything. Like, every single thing that was good about Madoka is ruined. If we could uh, sacrifice Rebellion to save the world. <laughs> And erase it from everyone's memories. It would be perfect. It would be so good! Madoka is saved! She's fine! Everything's fine! Uh, But it's like... Yeah. Well, but just talking about the original Madoka series. The ending is very good. Yeah. And it's very, very Valor-based. Because it's so... It's so sad. It's so sad, but, like, you're like, you needed to do it. I understand that you had to save your friends. Um, It's something that I really like um, about certain games, mm-hmm. like, where you, they give you the choice mm-hmm. about whether or not, like, you're going to sacrifice a thing to save the world. Like, Telltale Games? Or, like, what were uh, like, you thinking about? I was thinking about Life is Strange again. Oh! <sighs> Crazy. Wow. <laughs> That's gay. Spoilers for Life is Strange. Uh, but That's they, gay. It's we can't talk about gay things on the show. <laughs> I have to leave. Oh, no. <laughs> you also have to leave. I have to... Oh. Uh, yeah, it's true. But, yeah, <laughs> uh, you get to, like, make that decision for yourself, which mm-hmm. I thought was, like, from a storytelling standpoint, really good. And you feel brave... If you Making make the those calls, like in any kind of situation like that mm-hmm. for you. I think another good example of it is we just went back to talk about other stuff. Oops. That's how you do it though. That's how you have to do it. Um Soma is a really good example of Valor. Oh yeah. I feel like because uh spoilers for Soma, uh which is I don't know if it's so much spoilers because it's just a gameplay mechanic. Like it's just a consistent gameplay mechanic. Oh, I wouldn't call it. I um, think you're fine. So like what you have to do is like you ha- make copies of yourself to progress forward. Like, you have to transfer... Like, you get certain points where it basically it makes a copy of mm-hmm. you that continues on. Uh, but every time you make it, there's a version of you that's left behind. So, you have to have the courage to make that copy and, like, go forward. Yeah. Like, you can't be scared of being the one that's left behind. Which, this is actual spoilers for someone. <laughs> is because at the end, you do the final copy, and you're stuck in the body that's left behind while your other copy moves forward. Yeah. But then you do get to see what the other copy is doing, like, through it. And it's like, so you do get, like, a, a like a satisfying ending. Yeah. That's not just sad. <laughs> but that final scene was real fucked up when you're just sitting there in it's that chair. Hard. And you're like, and you, like, your character's like screaming about it. It's like one of the. Because, like, you've already made so many copies at that point, and then, um, like, seeing. Being the player that doesn't get to move forward after you've done that to so many other uh, versions, it's like. Right, it, it's like- it was a hard moment. It it's was like heavy. A, one of the most devastating. Uh, speaking of devastating video games, oh, oh. Uh, <laughs> choice making. Uh, I'm fi- finally got a copy, meaning <laughs> I stole uh, someone else's copy nice. of uh, this war of mine. Oh yeah! I'm like I'm really excited. Do it. I don't know how brave I'm gonna feel about <laughs> it, but I know I'm gonna cry. There you go. That's nice. how you gotta do it sometimes. <laughs> But yeah, uh, we also should maybe talk about one of our favorite games, which is Alice. Oh, that's yeah. a healthy amount of valor in there. Yeah, feels like because fuck, dude, everything bad happens to her. Yeah, I don't like. I'd say um, that's one of the like madness returns, mm-hmm. especially. Yeah, I feel like that's a lot of. It has, like, in a more traditional sense, I guess American Mickey's Alice might have more, but it's, like, it's a very intimate relationship uh, between the physical monsters that you're fighting Mm -hmm. and your ability to uh, face trauma. It's, like, all very interconnected in Madness Returns. Right, well, because it's, in Madness Returns we get that, what it's like when she's not hallucinating. We get to see the world and we get to see all the people in it who these monsters are based off of. Yeah. And so we see so much more of it, and then, like, we get to see, like... uh, I think, like, the really... One of the 
strongest scenes in it is it's when you're in the doll. It's the dollhouse level, yeah. uh, and you're going through the asylum, mm-hmm. uh, and you're, like, seeing all, like, the tools and everything, and, like, the patients in the chairs, and you're seeing, like, what she's going through in the flashbacks, and then, like, all the giant tools, and it's, like, then you have that boss fight in there. Um, Madness Returns is an interesting choice also, because, uh, just because of the way that the story was told, mm-hmm. I felt... It's one of the only games where I've almost felt like it takes more courage to watch the cutscenes than mm. it does to play the game. Oh, definitely. Um, I, well, because some of them are so disturbing. Because the one like, that really got uh, like right before you go into the doll maker and mm-hmm. you get to see the doll like being the doll pieces being right separated, and it's and like, like that was. That jarred me, I think, more than going into the battle, like, with the doll maker. Right, it's, like, watching him, like, take the dolls and, like, taking off their heads and everything and, like, dropping them. And, like, that whole thing, it's really unsettling. Madness Returns is a good game, guys. It's a real good game. It's definitely up there in favorite games for me. It's, like, it's real fucking good. Um... But, I mean, and also, the ending is just very satisfying. Which we shouldn't say, because then they won't get it. Yeah. I feel like that's one of the things that you really have to like. Uh, play Madness Returns, Please though. play Madness Returns. Please let us have somebody else to talk to it about <laughs> besides ourselves. <laughs> yeah. Also support the third game on Patreon. It's yeah. there. Please do that. Please I'd do like that. a third game. I would also like a third game. It looks really good. Um, but, yeah. It's very... It's a lot of, it's very interesting the way Valor comes through in, like, multiple situations. Because it's like, you can have Valor through anger, you can have it through selflessness, you can have it through selfishness. Uh, but as long as it's, as long as you've built up for the payoff of those courageous actions, it's gonna be good. Um, and my recommendation also... Uh, mm-hmm. to anyone, um, would be to, like, if you feel like you're having trouble, um, expressing that kind of, because the thing about Valor is it's also very rewarding. Right. It's, like, it's a very high-risk thing, uh, for your character, uh, to display Valor, but in, when it's done, when it's, like, it usually comes at a price, but it's such a rewarding thing, and, uh, it's something that, this is one of those instances where it's a really good idea to draw from personal experience. Mm-hmm. Um, if you're afraid of something, I recommend doing it. Right. No limitations on that. <laughs> Wait a second. Are you, Hold on. Are you afraid of heights? Jump off a bit. No. No. Back to Cat's Bad be, Advice Hour. Be a cannibal. Just stop it. Oh, uh, <laughs> you stop the cannibalism. Oh, stop put away my human flesh. Stop it. <laughs> uh, no, but I I would recommend uh, trying something that you're, like, really afraid to do. Right, like, even if it's just, like, a small step towards it, like, just, like, make a little bit of progress towards what you're afraid of. Like, within reason, of course. Yeah. Uh, don't, like, kill yourself over it. Right. If you're scared of death, don't kill yourself. <laughs> Bad idea. We do liners. Stop that. <laughs> you stop it. <laughs> you're out of here. I'm afraid to leave, so I'm just gonna do that now. Because um, you have to get in my car. <laughs> I'm, I'm scared to leave. Someone come pick me up. <laughs> <Uh-oh>. <laughs> oh no, this podcast is a mess. <laughs> uh, but like. And it can be, it's one of those things where it's like, you know, obviously there are different levels of fear, but... Right. Like, try taking something on. Because like, you'll do it, hopefully. It'll go well. And then right. you'll feel better. And then you'll know more what that feeling is like. Because it doesn't... The thing is, like, whatever you feel, like, you just have to multiply it to the appropriate degree. Yeah. Like, you don't have to feel that same level of intensity... But if you know a little bit what it feels like, you're going to have an easier time writing it out or, like, expressing it. Yeah. So, like, go get something pierced or have, like, a... Play something on the highest difficulty. The oh. through, through to the end. Like, stick with something. Um, uh, what are other things that Eat that food you... you don't like. 
Oh, eat, well, like, yeah. Eat, like, not a food you don't like, but that you've been afraid to try. Cause... Yeah, like, try something new. Trying something new is a good one. Right, if, like, don't, like, be intimidated by something new. I mean, obviously you're allowed to be intimidated by it, but don't let your that intimidation get in your way. Uh, like, take a professional chance. Take, like, creative chances. Like, if there's a thing that you want to write or draw or whatever, but you're afraid of how it'll be received, do it anyway. Right, because in the end, you don't have to post it. Yeah. You could just, like, if you're satisfied with just making it, that's half the battle. And right it'll there. be a learning experience. And those feelings are things that you can use later. Right, you can springboard off of those feelings. So that's everybody's homework. Yeah. Or something... Valortastic. Mm. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> We're going to the amusement park now. Nice. Going back to see your point. Good. Let's go to King's Island. It's scarier. <laughs> Woo! It's also three hours away. Nice. Probably closed. <laughs> That's what happened last time I tried to go to King's Island. That sounds correct. Uh, I'll, go <laughs> I'll go to Cedar Point first because it's more fun. Yeah. And then because we can get Pokestops. Oh, While yeah. we're there. We could ride on that little train that takes you around past all the polka stops. Yeah. And because it goes slow enough, it also counts as walking your eggs. Right. And you can hatch all your eggs. You just stay on that all day. Hashtag Team Mystic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so let's, I think a good way to finish this episode is to summarize uh, Pokemon teams as amusement park rides. Uh, team Val is a fucking dragster. Uh, Team Mystic is getting on the train that's slow <laughs> enough to count as walking your eggs and hit all the Pokestops. Team Instinct is going to the petting zoo. <laughs> nice. And trying to win all those carnival plushes you know you'll never get, but they're so darn cute. So cute. That's my summary. Good. That's a good that's summary. Good. I like it. Uh, so, I, so that's our Pokemon summary. Valor summary. Do something brave. Uh... I don't know. Uh, also, I guess we're assigning homework on this podcast Yes, we're now. assigning homework now. Nice. <laughs> Are you afraid of not doing your homework? Don't do it! Yeah. Good. Are you afraid of doing your homework? Be cannibal. <laughs> I was about to say, also, last lesson, <laughs> eat the rich. That's also your homework. Uh, nice. I, it's not going to get better than that. We have to end it now. Bye, guys. <laughs> We should do an outro! Oh. This has been unsolicited advice. I'm Bubblegum. I'm not afraid to skip this outro. See you later! You cannibals, you. Talking to. Yeah. Cat over here. Nice.